Good afternoon and welcome to the Future of Finance's discussion on Central Bank Digital Currencies Part 2. Welcome and I shall now hand you over to Dominic Hobson and our panel. Hello everybody, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. Welcome to our second webinar on Central Bank Digital Currencies, CBDCs. Since we last discussed this topic six months ago, momentum has clearly increased uh, and the momentum is equally clearly running in favour, not of a wholesale CBDC, which would remain effectively a purely interbank phenomenon, but of retail CBDCs, in which the CBDC will be a direct cash-like claim on the central bank, and in most cases distributed and operated by private banks. Last month, the Bank for International Settlements data recorded 41 retail CBDC projects in hand at central banks, and 16 wholesale CBDC projects. But only five of those 16 wholesale projects are not also looking at a retail CBDC. This month, the Kiffmeister blog records 50 retail CBDCs in train at central banks around the world. Seven of them actually launched or at the proof of concept or pilot stage, 34 definitively being explored, and a further nine reported to be being explored. So CBDCs are starting to happen, and it feels increasingly as if the first CBDC in a major currency is no longer a matter of if, but of when. So today we're going to talk not about the theory of a CBDC, but about the practicalities design, technology choices, risks, how a CBDC will change payments domestically and across borders, what it might do to stable coins and cryptocurrencies, what other innovations it might spawn, what the benefits might be, what the disadvantages might be, and what it means for monetary policy and regulation. To help us do all of that, we're joined by six experts in the field. Daniel Eden is a computer scientist now working as a solution architect at R3 and co-author of the R3 white paper, Central Bank Digital Currency, and innovation in payments. Keith Baer is a physicist and former IBM executive who's now a fellow at the Judge Business School in Cambridge, where he's linked to the Center for Alternative Finance. Simon Chantry is a mechanical engineer who co-founded BIT, a payments industry fintech working on a CBDC with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. Rob Patelano is an economist who's worked at the Federal Reserve and the ECB and with the Financial Stability Board. And he's now leading financial markets activities at the OECD in Paris as a deputy head of division. Sebastian Grevery is a former head of network and product management at Clearstream, now heading product strategy for an artificial intelligence startup. Sven Werner is a managing director at State Street in London, where he leads the development of new products and services based on blockchain technology, including digital and tokenized assets. As always, in addition to the panelists, we have you, our audience, and all seven of us encourage everybody watching or listening to submit questions and comments throughout the webinar by using the functionality at the bottom of your Zoom screens. We will not save your questions up to the end, but endeavor to answer them uh, as we go along. Now with those uh, introductions out of the way, it's time to get going. And I thought I might come to you first, uh, Simon. We've got, as I mentioned, these 50 live CBDC projects uh, that are retail. Uh, as I say, Kiffmeister identifies these 50, the most important of them are the ones in, in China, uh, and Sweden, but uh, we also talked last time, in fact, about the about the sand dollar, uh, and we talked to also about uh, what you're doing with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. So I suppose my my question is: Should we be surprised that there's been? A, am I wrong? I mean, I'm open to the possibility I may be wrong, but but I don't think so. Should we be surprised by this tilt uh, in favour of retail as opposed to wholesale CBDCs? Thanks, Dominic, and it's a great question. I think uh, when it comes to wholesale CBDCs in particular, I think the uh, the pilot projects being discussed basically represent a technology upgrade for RTGS networks, and so they're not they're not quite as exciting or groundbreaking, uh, and they don't offer, I guess, as much uh, you know upside, risk, novelty in general uh, that retail level CBDC projects do. And so in looking at uh, retail CBDC projects, it represents really not just a technology upgrade, but also uh, an augmented policy, an opportunity for a nation to provide digital currency infrastructure as a backbone for their economy, for their financial system uh, at a, at a, at a, at a, to a greater degree, to a degree that the central banks have not yet done in the past in a, in a digital fashion. And so that would be my first answer is that uh, our RTGS networks, you know, done on distributed ledger technology or done under the guise of being a wholesale CBDC are mainly just a technology upgrade for the RTGS networks with per potentially more integration options 
uh, on top of that. Whereas uh, a, a retail CBDC does sort of push the boundary a little bit further. Uh, and, it, and it also enables the state to burden some of the costs of operating a, a, a national digital currency network that other entities, payment service providers, you know, government payments platforms, et cetera, uh, could integrate into. I think uh, one of the things that is yet to be determined is the opportunity for hybrid networks. Uh, in theory, a CBDC could be used to settle interbank uh, owings between one another like an RTGS network. And so there is an opportunity to consolidate networks here. And I, I would say that would be pushing the boundary even one step further. Um, so uh, again, I, but I think laying the groundwork uh, for a retail uh, payment system, you know, it enables you to, or rather it will be designed to ensure that you know uh, transactions per second are adequate for uh, for whatever economy we're, we're speaking about uh, that security is there so that multiple participants can access it and so you're laying the groundwork for a very powerful transaction network that could be accessed by other institutions in the future as well that's those are uh, yeah some of my thoughts on that dominic i'm surprised that the uh, that the some of the central banks were not discouraged by the the Bank of England's experience with looking to replace its RTGS with a with blockchain technology. It decided against it um, a couple of years ago, and now in its white papers, it's talking about building an entirely separate infrastructure alongside that RTGS to support the CBDC. Anyway, that's just an observation from me, mm -hmm. um, Rob. Um, You've heard Simon talk about the fact that these uh, most of these retail CBDCs are in fact refurbishments of, of RTGS systems where they're experimenting with distributed ledger technology. Um, are you? Uh, what's your view about the balance is it in the central banking community between wholesale and retail at the moment? Sure. Thank you, Dominic, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you and with the panelists today. So. I would say that, you know, first of all, I, uh, we should acknowledge it's really quite stunning that the pace at which the discussion among central banks and at the BIS has moved from being quite uncomfortable with any form of, of CBDC and even with crypto assets and then moving quite quickly over the past few years, first looking pretty, pretty closely at wholesale, now looking toward retail. And I think if you look at some of the uh, reports and pilots, the rationale for looking at retail is gaining strength. And that's causing more assessment of the operations and the choices around retail. So whether they're looking at financial inclusion, other forms of efficiency, I even think that they're thinking of retail with, with the Libra um, experience in mind to make sure that they have some sort of strategic initiative uh, in particular to make sure from a financial stability standpoint and a financial consumer protection standpoint that they have in a sense an alternative to a global stable coin that's feasible and that can be rolled out if needed. And even in some cases you'll see with these analytical reports, they're saying these are concepts and we may or may not roll this out, but here's what it would look like. I think that's a strategic initiative. Um, so I think you're gonna see certainly more, um, more review and assessment in this area. They'll be working with some of the panelists here and others in the private sector to see what's feasible and how they can pull this off. I do think there are a lot of operational challenges and reputational challenges. And of course, that's what we'll be discussing today. Keith, uh, what's, your, what's your perspective uh, on this? You, you've, um, you've heard Simon describe it, a lot of it's RTGS refurbishment. You've heard Rob uh, say that central banks are very anxious to make sure that they have some sort of project in place to head off the threat of Libra affecting their monetary sovereignty. Uh, are we potentially looking at a world in which central banks might actually run retail bank accounts that you and I could have accounts at the central bank? Uh, I think it's largely unlikely. I mean, uh, BIS have done a number of surveys, obviously, of, of the multitude of central bank digital currency projects that run away. And I think the, uh, the majority of those are using a two-tier model where basically the commercial banking system uh, has the responsibility for the onward issuance into the, the broader retail community. Um, so there have, whilst there have been some central uh, uh, experiments along those lines, I think the two-tier model is the most common. Uh, so I think it's pretty unlikely for multiple reasons. Obviously, the central bank doesn't necessarily have the infrastructure, the capability, the resources, et cetera, to be able to manage a retail uh, business in the way that commercial banks do. And it also doesn't necessarily want to compete with the commercial banking environment itself. So maybe there are some, some jurisdictions where the commercial banking 
um, industry doesn't necessarily have the right experience and industry uh, capability to be able to uh, take this on. And maybe there will be some limited uh, centralized models, but I think the vast majority of times it'll be a two-tier model. And you know, our relationship uh, in terms of the provision of a central bank digital currency and the provisioning of wallets uh, will be through the commercial banking entities. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sebastian, can you give us a, um, a, a sort of commercial banking perspective on this issue, for one thing? And secondly, do you think that we might be in a situation where non-banks start to uh, start holding reserves at the, at the central bank? You know, the, the Chinese, who are very advanced with their CBDC project, do insist that non-bank payment service providers hold reserves at the central bank. We've seen the Bank of England relax its criteria about who can... Uh, essentially have access to central bank money. What's the commercial bank perspective on everything that you've heard so far this afternoon? And what will the role of, central, the role of commercial banks be in yeah. making a CBDC happen? A lot of questions there, but uh, piggy, piggybacking on, on Keith's response first, uh, it's pretty obvious that the, the technology uh, white page will, will not transform the industry and we will maintain the two-tier structure and and a lot of the functions uh, of uh, the sovereignty of money management basically uh, and uh, and the structure of, of the industry which means that as you said uh, commercial banks will remain uh, very big players in in payment systems and they will be part of the solution of any uh, digital currency that is created central bank digital currency obviously um, but where, where it's not very clear is, is in the level of cooperation or competition in between the, the regulators and the systems in enabling different use cases with different relaxing of permissions, basically. And to that effect, I, th I think I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I do think that a lot of discussion are, are still very open and, and will generate, um, some, operating models that, that will enable non-banks to actually, you know, as PSPs uh, enter the realm of the, of, uh, of the central bank's uh, management, basically. Uh, because otherwise um, you're, you're leaving things unchanged and then you're not leveraging any of the benefits of the technology. So that, that would be my short answer. Um, I, beyond that, I think that is gonna be very nationalistic in its approach. And so you will see a lot of responses that will depend on either use cases, as Keith highlighted, of certain mature markets versus less mature markets, or uh, very specific use cases for the industry. No, no hegemonic views there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to come to you in a, in a minute, Daniel, to give us so you're involved directly in some of these projects, and so it'd be good to get a, a sense from you of what's happening uh, with with projects that are live. But Sven, perhaps you could give us a. a a view. One of the things that occurs to me is if this remains a two-tier system, uh, one of the objectives of a CBDC is to start reducing transaction costs uh, in the payments in payment space in particular. Uh, how are we going to see costs fall if central banks don't take on more of the heavy lifting? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously that's, that, that's always a question, but then uh, the cost is a uh, uh, complex subject and uh, as you know particularly in the UK if you're a retail consumer you don't necessarily pay for making uh, payments so it's a, uh, it's a question what's the level of cost but also uh, who's paying for this um, I, I think the cost for the industry isn't it uh, absolutely absolutely yeah. um, the but, but isn't this in, in you know the, the level of competition you can uh, drive by by having uh, the the pricing at the, the right level um, obviously depends on on that structure but then um, the uh, what I would say is like at one point around the um, uh, the the question what's the ultimate purpose of the um, uh, of a CBdc so one aspect obviously is uh, risk uh, in terms of facing a commercial bank liability versus what is perceived as the sort of safest place i.e a, a central bank and there are multiple ways uh, to get there. Uh, and actually, in fact, uh, if you think about or look through the, the literature, I think the, the most sort of early idea of a CBDC is, you know, it's nothing new. We didn't just dream that up a few uh, months ago, but was already discussed um, 30 years ago. And um, in, for me, sort of the irony in that sense is uh, one of the early proponents of that idea 
uh, was James Tobin, who's you know, very famous for, for the idea around the Tobin tax. And uh, he put forward that idea that you could solve that issue by basically the Federal Reserve Bank in the US providing what he called uh, Fed funds, i.e. a risk-free asset that could be held um, by uh, by uh, uh, any investor, whether it be a bank or a retail investor. And uh, so then the question is, and that is now uh, coming back to my earlier point around who pays, this is quite important. If you look at some of the stablecoin models that sort of came before you had the central bank model, what they basically promise is a transaction cost free payment model, but you forgo the return on the investment, i.e., your stablecoin issuer would take that money, reinvest it, and uh, pay for the infrastructure uh, based on, on the, the return you could garner from, from these assets. And I think that's, that's the key aspect here where we can't discuss this in isolation. Cash has multiple uh, dimensions. You have a return investment, you have a liquidity aspect to that. And uh, if you're changing the, if you want the equation that we have so far, it doesn't necessarily mean it's uh, uh, getting you know, more cost effective. There, there's also an element of uh, part of the infrastructure need to be paid for and uh, that problem wouldn't go away. So therefore I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily say that if we maintain the two tier model that you described earlier is a bad thing. Uh, what I think for me is more important is how can we actually now use that different payment model more effectively? And I'm sure we come to this later when it comes to smart contracts and all of these ideas, they really fundamentally change the experience a consumer would have. And I think that's the interesting aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Daniel, uh, R3 is, is engaged in live projects. What has changed since we last spoke six months ago in terms of attitudes and design that central banks are looking at? What has changed in the last six months? I guess, I guess in a nutshell, a lot has changed in the last six months as, as everybody is testament to. to. Um, well, I would say, you know, if, if I continue along the, the thread of the conversation, kind of dividing up between retail and wholesale, I would say that on the wholesale side, everything that was said is, is accurate. You know, wholesale is, the case has largely been proven from a, from a technology standpoint. And I think that a lot of the projects that we're seeing on the wholesale side are moving from POCs to trying to push real pilot transactions. I think that some of the challenges in wholesale now are being externalized from the domestic setting to a cross-border setting. So we see kind of an increase on uh, network sovereignty. And in the context of that network sovereignty, atomic transactions that cross those borders. So payment versus payment and offshore settlement that happens outside of the issuing country. So we're really kind of putting pressure on, 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 on the boundaries of the possible in the wholesale, in the wholesale environment. And we see that with uh, work that's being done by the BIS and the FSB. And there's, there's a lot of talk about cross-border payments and making them more efficient and transparent. Um, but, but, you know, momentum has picked up on the retail side uh, for many, many reasons. And I think, and, and many of them have described here. It's interesting to also think about what, what is instigating those, those moves. What's the motivation? Every central bank lives in a, in a little bit of a different environment. It's interesting to think whether it's an, uh, a, an offensive play or a defensive play uh, as well, I think changes the, the, the environment that the central banks are operating in. But on the retail side, I'm not surprised at the number of projects at all. I think that we're going to, we have we have a significant amount of work to do before any of these retail projects become uh, something that's feasible. And a lot of the challenges uh, on the technology, on the governance, on, on, the, on the legal side uh, really lie um, in, in the retail realm. Uh, you know, things like custody, things like data, things like identity, things like offline transactions. I mean, these are things that are, are really pushing uh, distributed ledgers uh, to, to the limits of their capacity. And I think that in a, in a lot of ways, distributed ledgers are being, are being developed with these particular use cases in mind, because th this, is, uh, this, this is the golden use case that, that people have been looking for. So uh, I expect to see a lot more work being done on the retail side. Uh, like I said, you know, the offline transactions, the intersection with identity, the data management, all of these things need to be carefully, carefully crafted. And then, of course, thinking about kind of the connection between the retail and the wholesale systems is, you know, as mentioned here before, uh, that, that's even pushing it yeah, even, even further in, in both of those uh, scenarios, both, both the retail and the wholesale. So that's, that's a little bit of a snapshot of, of what we've been working on in the last six months without naming any names. Okay, thanks. And we'll pick up some of the things you mentioned about cross-border payments and technology choices 
uh, a bit later on. We've had a question uh, come in from Chris Pryor Williard, who, who one of you used the term nationalistic. I think it was Sven. Um, it, Chris says, so the fragmentation of currencies and the absurdity of multiple central banks existing where one would do, such as the you know, European Union, uh, will persist. Isn't this an excellent opportunity for the ECB to make a land grab towards the dream of a single European market? Uh, or even better, the, the BIS. He's asking whether this would be a, a good opportunity to, to actually reduce the number of central banks we have and have a regional currency in Europe, and maybe even um, a kind of global currency administered by the BIS. Uh, Rob, this is a, a, a question for you because, and, the, and, and it, sure. it contains, why don't you address Chris's question and then- uh, Sure, I'll... actually, I, I saw the chat come up and mm -hmm. I thought that was, it's a fascinating question. So look, wh whether we're talking about crypto or not, um, and, and, having, and having worked at the ECB during, during, during the sovereign crisis about a decade ago, I can say that there's an element which is fiscal. So it's so you can say there there is a nationalistic element, but it's really fiscal is at the national is driven by the national level. And even though you may have the ECB and the euro at a, at a regional level, having some basis in choice at the national level. So you know you can have input through your your governor to the ECB that that's providing perspective on the national economy and and, and supply and demand of um, of assets and liquidity. But I think also the interplay between fiscal and some aspects of the monetary, perhaps, I mean, monetary broadly speaking, which includes bank supervision, the choice of collateral policies, how it's implemented, et cetera. And I think I'm, I'm bringing this back to CBDC. It's interesting that the discussions are happening at that level, but you're also seeing national central banks talking about their preferences because you may, be, you may find even within a currency area that certain nations have different uses of mobile versus versus cash or, or the need for financial inclusion. They may have stronger commercial banks. So I think getting that debate right, and Europe is a nice um, example of that, where there are different countries that have different financial structures within, within the Euro area and thinking through getting a, um, a central bank digital currency right so that it functions in these different environments will be very important. As for the BIS and the IMF, yeah, there, there, there is discussion, discussion about some sort of hegemonic currency that could replace the dollar. Would it be in a central bank digital currency form? I think that's an interesting discussion, but I still think at the end of the day, fiscal is based on nationality and that interplay is really important. Mm -hmm. And just very quickly, Rob, what clearly central banks are concerned about loss of control here, but almost any choice they make contains risks for them, reputational risks, risks of loss of control, uh, which, as you say, might well affect fiscal policy as well. Uh, to what extent are central banks worrying about what their choices will do to how this market develops? Is that what's really keeping them awake at night? If they make the wrong sure, choice, I, I, terrible might happen. Absolutely. I think it's keeping them awake at different levels. Uh, this is just a personal perspective, but I think, I mean, even since our, our, our this wonderful discussion we all had perhaps last summer, I was giving a little bit more thought to this concept of trust in central banking. Even as far back as the Roman civilization, the, the interlink between money and religion and, and money and, and the, the icon of, of, of a church or, or some sort of form is very, very important. And I think even in the modern day, this, this, this icon that the trust in, in money and the running of monetary policy has some sort of sacred feel to it. What are you going to outsource with the CBDC? So I think if you're looking at something that's programmable or there is technology embedded in it, I find it hard to see that the central bank would be able to outsource and take the reputational risk. At the same time, as we're discussing, there are some huge operational challenges, particularly on the retail side. So this concept that's a, that's a central bank would move into an area where it doesn't have superior expertise and it could be putting the fundamental element of money at risk. Is my money safe? Is it safer with the central bank or safer under my mattress? Do I trust it? Do I trust monetary policy? Would I prefer gold or a Bitcoin or something else? I think those elements are really being explored now within central banks and a lot more research is needed. And of course, engagement with markets and with technologists. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit now about the, about the, the risks of doing this. Now, the, the risk which was central to this uh, when CBDCs first began to be discussed and, and pre-Libra was that this would undermine the, the funding of the commercial banking sector and, and therefore their ability to lend and the entire um, banking uh, pyramid might start to be affected in, in an adverse way. A couple of solutions have been put forward to this. Uh, one is to cap 
the amount of CBDC that can be held by anybody. The other is to cap or to tier the interest rates uh, to prevent banks losing losing funding. Um, Daniel, has that has that risk gone away as a result of these two solutions, the, the, the tiering and the and the cap on on deposit taking? Do central banks now feel comfortable that that risk has been solved? Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think so at all. And I think I think the the list of uh, risks is, uh, is is much longer than than what you mentioned. Um, so I think the risks uh, the risks continue to, uh, to 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 pop up in different in different environments. I think the fact that there still is so much motivation to explore this is a testament to the to the upside that this this technology has as well to counteract those risks. Uh, I think probably the first and foremost risk is is the risk of fraud and and improper use of this tool. I think our intuition. Uh, is pretty limited when we think about this in, in, with respect to a distributed system of digital currencies. Uh, it's really hard to wrap your head around, well, what does fraud mean in this environment where we potentially issue a tokenized bearer asset that lives uh, potentially even is custodied off, offshore in a place that maybe the central bank doesn't have direct uh, legislative authority over? Um, uh, things like, you know, the disintermediation and the impact on the financial sector are things that are very, very hard to simulate in, in uh in pilots and in lab environments without actually doing proper issuances and seeing how things behave in the real world. Uh, and, then, and then things like um, user privacy and ultimately adoption as well. Um, what's the chance that central banks build this uh, and it isn't used? And, and is that something that's, that's okay and serves as a function as a safety net for the private sector or is, is adoption uh, of, of the citizens, at least on the retail side, something that's uh, you know paramount of importance to success of, of projects like this. So I don't think the risks have gone away at all. I think we're continuing to explore the risks, and we're continuing to counter counterbalance the risks with some of the with some of the uh, with some of the value that we see in at least in the retail context. Mm -hmm. Simon, you've you, you've heard Daniel say that that the risks aren't confined to commercial banks losing their funding base. You know, it might increase the speed of bank runs. It might increase um, financial crime. Uh, who knows? Money laundering, terrorist financing, as well as simple old-fashioned fraud. Um, uh, you know, the hacking of, uh, of of a cyber currency might also increase. So the kind of cybersecurity problem is increased. What's your um, What's your perspective on this? Do, 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 um, to what extent are banks thinking about bank runs, for example, becoming easier to occur? With a CBDC, because you can simply move it much faster than heading down to the bank and getting your money out. Yeah, I guess the beauty of these systems is that they're they they are basically programmable money, and so the the extent to which you can uh, estimate different financial actions based on the past, based on you know research, etc. Uh, the beauty of these systems is that you can program to either mitigate or act upon certain conditions that you see um, in the financial system at large. And so I think there, it's an obvious concern. Uh, and yet the, the sort of safeguards that you can program into the system offer at least you know, some solutions to, uh, to what we're seeing here. Um, I, again, and I think it's, a, it's about balancing the risks. You know, we have, it, it's like the central banks are in a position where uh, they, they, they recognize that there are challengers in terms of payments, in terms of store value, et cetera, in terms of currency. And that is coming from the private sector, like we discussed uh, with the likes of, uh, of Libra or Diem. And, uh, and then also, you know, with digital currencies like, uh, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And so they have to act in some way uh, because it, do it doesn't seem like, uh, like the existing private sector players will be able to, uh, to compete at that level. So if, uh, uh, so I guess they're sort of, you know, they're, they're in a position where they're in a rock and a hard place and they, and they are, are looking at the technology to say what, you know, how can we use this to ensure uh, that we're able to continue to achieve our, our institutional mandate of economic stability and, and, uh, and being the, the monetary authority of a country. And then you, you add to that uh, when a country like China has the stated intent of exporting their digital currency. Uh, then that, that compounds risk or that adds additional risk from, from other states uh, when the stated intent is to use the, their, their currency abroad. So I would say, you know, the, the solutions, or rather there are solutions to these problems. And the fact that, uh, that these networks represent uh, programmable money 
um, offer really, really interesting solutions to, uh, to bank runs and, and so on. But then also, I would say, consider the upside, consider the upside of the technology where um, it may very well bring about increased competition in payment systems. So uh, if you can bring down the cost of payments, um, then the positive effects that that could have on the economy uh, you know, could be widespread and could be substantial. And then, of course, as we move to the international context, um, the positive aspects in, in terms of decreasing foreign exchange, decreasing latency uh, for, uh, for exchange and settlement times, um, this, this could very well free up quite a bit of liquidity uh, from, for institutions of, of all types. So I would say it's about balancing the risks and, uh, and making decision, uh, you know, an informed decision on what the technology can actually do for you as, uh, as an institution, as a central bank. Mm -hmm. Keith, just could, perhaps you could round out this risk discussion for us. A CBDC entails moving to a you know a twenty four seven three six five uh, money system, and that implies changes in the way people make payments throughout the entire economy. It's going to affect all consumers, all households, all firms. We won't need ATMs anymore, but we are going to need uh, universal access to broadband, and not everyone's going to to have that or, or will be able to afford it. So, how big is the transition risk? To a, to a CBDC, Just setting aside even the central bank perspective on this, they clearly think it's a big risk. Uh, how big do you think it is from a purely technical, making this happen point of view? How big is the transition risk? Uh, significant, I think, just to pick up on your comment on not needing ATMs. It was interesting, I think uh, there was a press article yesterday that Agricultural Bank of China is now upgrading their ATMs in Shenzhen to support uh, the electronic one in, uh, as part of the PBOCs. Uh, CBDC project, so uh, you know ATMs may still have a role to play, which will probably keep the uh, as a form of broadband system. for people who can't afford their own <laughs> in internet connection. You mean? <laughs> well, it's a question of where the uh, it seems a sensible use of them, right? Uh, well, the, I, I wouldn't knock it, but uh, it's just an interesting comment, I think, to see that you know the physical machines in the wall may still have a role to play. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, I think the transition risk is obviously significant. And the positive thing, uh, obviously, the central banks themselves are taking a very um, slow and steady approach. Uh, you know, I don't mean that by way of criticism, but you know, because of the risk of unknown unknowns, for all the reasons you touch on, uh, I think obviously it's uh, significantly, we can significantly see the steady progress being made. Uh, I was looking up earlier when the first Bank of England paper issued on uh, CBDC. I found one in 2016. I'm not sure if that was the first. Maybe they were earlier ones. Uh, but if you compare, you know, five years ago, some of the uh, highly effective research being done on the subject all the way through to the, um, the experiments and the pilots that we'll be talking about and some of the, you know, advanced implementations such as in China and the Bahamas, etc., uh, even in China, where the, the scale of the pilot is obviously pretty significant, uh, it won't be until post-2022 that we're likely to see a live implementation of the plan, I believe, is to see it in operation in the uh, Winter Olympics in Beijing in 2022. Uh, but it'll be some time after that before it's actually in production. So that's a, you know, a long period of time. Uh, and I think the sequence that China's taking is quite uh, very effective in terms of flushing out all these kinds of issues, you know, how it's being done with, uh, you know, we touched on demand, will people actually use it? Uh, especially in China, I think, where 80% of payments take place through Ant, Alipay and uh, WeChat Pay, et cetera. Uh, will people actually use it in that respect? So uh, being able to incent the broader population to take advantage of it, uh, the rationale for them to be able to do that, there's a whole set of uh, issues uh, to resolve, I think. And so this stepwise approach to be able to flush out where the issues may be, what the solutions may be, et cetera. Do ATMs have a role to play or not, et cetera, uh, is really critical. So I think, yes, there is a significant transition risk, but the, uh, the positive thing is, I think that's well recognized by the central banks and we can see that in the plans that are progressing in the more advanced jurisdictions. Yeah, so we're gonna need a big public education campaign apart from <laughs> anything else, a bit like the, uh, the COVID-19 campaigns, which are so effective for us. Um, could we talk a little bit about about the impact on on, on payments? Simon mentioned uh, it would increase competition. Um, Daniel mentioned the impact on on cross border um, cross border payments. I wonder, um, Sebastian, whether this the, these are issues on which you have a a perspective. Can we expect a CBDC to actually increase genuine competition in domestic payments? And I say that. But slightly cynically, I think of all the so-called innovations in, in payments are really somewhat parasitic on existing infrastructures. They're not genuine 
innovations? Do you think we'll get some genuine innovations in domestic payments, point one? Point two, at the moment, cross-border payments are intermediated very largely by, uh, by correspondent banks. Uh, are, is their role at risk in the future uh, if CBDCs take off? So I have two questions for you. Yeah. Question. So the first one, as you said, is uh, my, my short answer would be it's unlikely. Um, and, and um, you know, I'm happy to be uh, challenged on that. But um, I think viewed from your own domestic world, uh, every domestic payment is fairly uh, fit for purpose in many, many ways. And, uh, and it's when you get to the cross-border questions that you have issues that become um, cost issues, complexity issues, system integration issues, all sorts of orchestration issues, legal issues, you name it, um, which brings you to the, uh, to the, um, the correspondent banking uh, business, basically. And, um, and you know, n not to uh, declare something dead before it's dead, um, if you've picked up the vibes of the time it will take or the existence, the mere existence of a CBDC to, to, to be a reality, and you add to this the, um, the likely transition challenges of different speeds and different markets and different regulations. And you can see here the, the very good point that I think you made earlier regarding the, uh, the Europe being the test bed of such a project. Uh, across different nations, basically, and different uh, agendas, then uh, you can see that the future of com commercial banks and correspondent banking is is somewhat safe for a long time. Uh, that being said, um, does that mean that there will be no innovation and there is no opportunity for some disintermediation of some of those players? Of course, there is. Um, I don't think you need distributed ledgers for that to actually be the case, to be totally frank. Uh, and, um, you know, even, you know, digital currencies don't need distributed ledgers uh, if, if you're really, uh, uh, you know, zeroing on, on all those questions. But, um, but so come to a, a, a very long uh, uh, game. Yes, this, the correspondent banking will have to change. It will probably have to adapt to a new infrastructure that would be created around the central uh, bank digital currency of the future of a given future. But uh, it is very unlikely that the service providers and the service provided around uh, that will, will disappear. So um, as I see the central banks being extremely cautious to first do no harm and second uh, foster innovation, I suspect that it will be a very concerted effort over the next many years to evolve those business lines and so we won't we won't see the disappearance of dinosaurs uh, anytime soon basically um before i i uh, pursue this cross-border payments question um and so peter davy draws to our attention a couple of risks what we were talking about earlier uh, there's a risk of uh, the money supply shrinking if you know commercial banks don't have the access to the deposits that enable them to increase the quantity of commercial bank money. He also points out if we're on a 24-7, 365 uh, settlement in central bank money, uh, we won't have a weekend where the world can be stopped to sort things out like we had in September 2008. Uh, those are, are two risks which we would do well to bear in mind. Uh, Chris Pryor would have just brings to an end our, our discussion about, um, you know, multinational CBDCs by saying he's old enough to have used the AQ uh, and SDRs, the old IMF special drawing rights. Uh, and he says the ECB thesis is to subsume national fiscal agenda in favor of the greater good, which is why the Eurozone national central banks are agents of the ECB. Uh, so he's looking forward to a single European uh, tax regime there for those countries lucky enough to remain inside the, the European Union. Um, Jerry Kickinson asked us, are any central banks considering allowing the public to maintain their own wallets? If commercial banks manage wallets and central banks de deploy a form of permission ledger, there's potentially even more direct control of the currency than now with improved protection against bank runs. I think that's what Simon was saying about programmable money, among other things. Uh, actually, you, you bank run risk can be managed better with these things. Or are central banks, as Jerry says, are central banks really looking at a real cash alternative 
with the same levels of privacy and distributed control. I don't think that's what they're looking to do in China, is it? Uh, uh, Keith, you know a lot about China. That's not the Chinese motivation, just very quickly. Uh, no, I, I, not as such, I think. I mean, the Chinese motivation, we can all speculate on that, but obviously uh, it has many manifestations, I think, in terms of resetting some of the financial systems uh, infrastructure in place, being able to further uh, the, 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 the kind of propagation of um, the digital economy within China itself. And obviously it's seen as a very significant uh, opportunity to move forward. And I think that's what we're seeing in the uh, PBOC's um, uh, you know, advances compared to other major economies at the moment. So clearly it's very much in the lead and I think that will make a significant uh, difference to how we see the landscape in the future. I'd like, I'd like Sven to, to comment on this as well, but, but while I've got your attention, Keith, um, to go back to the question of cross-border payments, uh, it seems to me to be prudent if the central banks are, for them to coordinate their, their CBDC efforts uh, to make them more flexible enough, in fact, to, to facilitate uh, cross-border payments. Are, are you aware of any discussions going on between central banks? And Rob, you might have something to say about this as well, uh, to yeah. coordinate what they're doing, standardise things? Well, uh, I took a great, uh, uh, you know, it was a very positive development, I think, to see the paper that was published by BIS together with Bank of England, uh, the Swedish Central Bank, ECB, uh, Bank of Japan, the Fed, uh, and also, I think I'm missing one, um, I thought that was a very positive um, uh, move in terms of uh, having a common view across all those institutions uh, in terms of, you know, laying down some foundational ground rules, if you like, uh, in terms of uh, what they see collectively as being the future of CBDC. Uh, so uh, whilst the paper, you know, doesn't go into great detail yet, I think that the fact that the, the half a dozen central banks and BIS are working along those lines, and most of those central banks are very active uh, in the cause of CBDC, such as uh, the Swedish uh, initiative, etc. Uh, there's a lot of collective experience in those banks uh, in terms of the pilots and experiments they've been doing with CBDC. Uh, so the fact they are cooperating in that way, and I'm sure this won't be a one-off, I think that really gives a really positive direction that that cooperation will lay down some effective standards and uh, interoperability will be one of the beneficiaries, I think, of that kind of approach. And of course, it shouldn't uh, stop without uh, talking about, uh, I'll let Rob mention OECD, of course, but uh, IMF and other um, you know, uh, jurisdiction uh, uh, entities that sit above the uh, national interest are obviously playing a major role in that as well. Uh, Sven, if you were a correspondent banker, and I, I know you're not, but if you were, would you be concerned that central banks were coordinating their discussions on CBDCs? <laughs> I'm talking uh, about of linking national RTGS systems together to knock them out of the business, really. Uh, yes. No, well, I, I, I would say uh, the, uh, the correspondent banking relationships have decreased over the years, and that at least initially wasn't uh, something to celebrate. Um, because obviously uh, that also means uh, less providers and uh, therefore less uh, choice. But yes, ultimately, yeah, I'm sorry, right. If we had uh, a vision to say you could create effective RTGS interoperability across the ma major currencies, that would be, you know, a huge crowding out factor um, to, towards either um, stablecoin and other private uh, digital payment solutions, but it also would, I think, to a large extent, um, reduce the need for uh, a CBDC. Uh, but maybe you can have both, I wouldn't rule that out because um, one of the aspects that I think is quite important is um, this, this aspect of motivation, what you are aiming for. So if all I'm really interested in is, you know, I moved some money to Keith um, because you know, whatever we uh, uh, went for dinner or whatever, and I pay for that. And quite frankly, I can do this at zero cost. We have a read, um, instant payment mechanism in the UK. I can do this real time. And he has the confirmation on his app in, you know, half a second. Why do you need a CBDC? So if therefore you need to, I think uh, we all need to step a little bit back and say, well, there are there are other aspects than the pure transaction to move money from, from A to B. There's uh, more to payments and cash management uh, than that. So Keith already mentioned China, uh, you know, what the problem being from the, based on the official statements, being that non-bank entities controlling the vast majority of retail payments, and they want to have a way of um, reining that in. We have 
this whole aspect that we haven't talked yet about, about micropayments, where you may have machines and, you know, you can borrow whatever the usage of a machine for an hour, and then you pay for that. And you, in the aspect of programmer money. So that is more than just making a normal A to B payment. It is uh, payments in areas and aspects that we haven't used it for. And for uh, wholesale payments that obviously uh, state organization probably is most interested in, it's very much about this idea to enable security tokens, because if we believing in using blockchain for, you know, the tokenization of all kinds of uh, real world assets, then you need to have a payment mechanism and neither the existing RDGS systems nor the existing retail system can really address this. So I think that that's quite important to say the when if you compare like for like you could really ask the question why bother but if you think about you may be enabling now a market or a payment uh, capability in markets or areas where they are not really used yet or they don't really exist then i think it's it's quite powerful so that's for me always the the real interesting mm -hmm. aspect you would almost uh, need to imagine using this for use cases that we haven't really experienced yet um, Simon, perhaps a, a quick comment on that from you. Sven's raised this, this question of micropayments. This, let's imagine we have this Internet of Things uh, and you're able to, the oil tank is empty or the fridge is empty. Uh, a micropayment can be made to fill both of them up again, or you're buying a bag of crisps, which is vatable at the point of sale. Uh, maybe the VAT could be sent directly to, to HMRC as you, as you make that, that transaction now. Who, Simon, is going to be doing that programming of money? Is it going to be the central bank or is it going to be the commercial banks? That's a great question. Uh, and certainly <clears throat> these networks should be designed to facilitate those sorts of payments. I think that's an excellent point by, uh, by Sven. Um, the, as, as far as who's going to be doing the programming, um, the answer really is both, the, there's an opportunity for both uh, types of stakeholders to do it. So, so the central bank, um, and central banks are actively considering which elements of programmability should be uh, should be designed and incorporated in, in the design of the CBDC network itself. So you can imagine that different transaction limits, limitations on different types of uh, classifications of wallets, uh, perhaps uh, transaction monitoring and reporting uh, functionality. These are things that may very well be hard coded into the network itself, or at least you can you can sort of imagine it as though that programmability just lives closer to the central bank, uh, whether it's on central bank controlled servers or, or, or whatever, to, or it's, it's actually designed in the architecture uh, that, that surrounds their own CBDC network that could live there. But also there will be the opportunity for payment service providers uh, to, to have, whether it's smart contract based payments or, or programmable payments uh, at the application layer as well. And, uh, and that will, very, will likely be facilitated. Uh, it, it'll be much easier facilitated in sort of zero cost uh, uh, payments models. So I think, and I do think that that's where central banks are moving. I think, you know, while there will be a drive to monetize these networks in some form or fashion, um, obviously the research quite clearly states that if you can, that, that, the, that the network should be offering free peer to peer payments. And so you think that would extend to, to micropayments, of course, given the, uh, uh, the gravity of that use case and, and the potential upside of, of realizing that use case. So yeah, the answer is both. I think that you'll see uh, some programmability right at the network layer and that will be central bank defined, but I do think that we'll, they'll also design for um, programmability at the application layer so that payment service providers can offer unique uh, and, and value add payments, uh, payments types to their clients. And, th and that can come from everything like splitting a bill very, very easily. And some of these apps are already out there, of course, but, uh, but doing it uh, with minimal cost is obviously what, you know, what we're looking to see in CBDCs. Now, now Rob, I know you wanted to say something about interoperability of, of, of CBDCs. Uh, and Daniel, I, I see you want to join in as well. Um, uh, but I'd like you also, um, uh, Rob, to think a little bit about, about uh, what the impact of a CBDC is going to be on stable coins and, and, and cryptocurrency. We've got, you know, will it display, displace stable coins completely? Uh, can we coexist with stable coins and can CBDC coexist with stable coins and, and crypto? And maybe in a way, central bank digital currencies kind of legitimize um, those alternative currencies and create a, actually start to encourage more of things like the DeFi boom, which we're, which DeFi token boom, which we're seeing at the moment. But um, uh, uh, Rob, perhaps you could, could address that 
that question about interoperability and correspondent banking first? Sure. So I was going to do three, three things. One is just to mention that there was a great question about what happens with, with um, disintermediation. And I think that there's a, there's a high level easy answer, which is the central bank has to reintermediate. And that is an important CBDC question, particularly for retail. But even if you look at money market funds or crisis, the central bank has to figure out how to reintermediate. And, and, and in Europe, for instance, banks are already, there are thousands of banks that are counterparties with the ECB. So if the ECB had to reintermediate, particularly in certain countries, it's able to do so within its current monetary policy and collateral framework. But if it's in one particular country, then the question is, is it monetary policy, which is an ECB policy, or do you do it through emergency lending, which is a country specific and has to do with national decisions? Then if you step back and you say, okay, well, what's, what's the issue with cross-border payment? I really think there was a missed opportunity here. I agree with Keith, like the, the BIS, BIS Information Hub, the FSB, CPMI with, this, with, with its payment discussions and its roadmap for this G20, it's all fabulous. But what the FSB did was it focused on the cross-border issues with data and with risks only for stable coins. And I think there is a broader, broader issue here for all type of crypto assets and that there needs to be, and even for CBDC, there needs to be more of a thought process around interoperability. And the OECD right now is working on blockchain policy principles to get down to the level of whatever form that asset is. If it's using blockchain, then think about interoperability, governance, data privacy, issues, issues like that. So, so we're trying to fit into that piece of the puzzle. And then I guess the last issue is the interrelationship between the central bank digital currencies and stablecoin. And it really, I mean, I really think it's a yes and no answer. It depends on the form of the CBDC and it depends on the forms of stablecoin. If you have a retail CBDC, then sure. I mean, if you had, if you had to wholesale versus Libra, they could coexist. If you have a retail CBDC, it depends on its form. Uh, as I was arguing before, I think get, getting the programmable aspects of the CBDC I think that's going to be a, a lengthy path because there are complications and reputational risks. If I were sitting in the position of stable coins, I would try and think about the features that aren't just pure currency features, but other types of features and to charge for them, right? So maybe the cost of using that stable coin is a little more, but you're getting embedded features that suit your needs. That's what finance is all about. You're tailoring it to the client's needs. So I think there is opportunity, but it's going to take a little bit more creativity than what we currently have. And uh, Daniel, I know you're burning to say something, just Rob, very quickly. Uh, are the central banks coordinating their efforts to regulate stable coins? This is something that came up last summer when we were looking forward to the Financial Stability Board report, on, uh, which came out with 10 recommendations, I think, in October, saying central banks need to get on and uh, coordinate their regulation of, of stable coins. Is that actually happening now? Rob? Have we lost you? Oh, so yes. So here's the thing. And again, pers a personal view, but I actually think that the G7, G20 really jumped on the Libra issue because it was a threat to monetary policy transmission. They realized they were behind on this very discussion we're having. I actually think the, the, the bigger issue here is actually if you have CBDCs legitimize, and I think there's a reason for doing so, the, the realm of digital finance, there is a comparison in the traditional world of credit intermediation to shadow banking and market-based finance, call them what you will. And I think here that relationship is DeFi. And there is a lot of activity that's growing very quickly in DeFi. Um, less regulation or less clear regulation and enforcement, a lot of use of leverage, there's yield farming and, and constructs um, that, that I think need greater scrutiny. And because it's decentralized, that may be harder to do. So if you start to move, um, populations, you know, uh, financial consumers into the space more quickly because of the legitimacy and the ease of use through the central bank digital currency, I think that's going to require a lot more scrutiny from market regulators. Whereas I think bank supervisors are already looking all over this from a banking and a stable coin perspective. Daniel. Thanks, Dominic. So, so maybe, maybe I'll also come in on on with uh, three quick points that are that are kind of uh, continuations to the to the conversation. So maybe first of all, with the programmability of money and the stable coins, I think it's. In, I agree with everything that it's been said, but I think it sh it should be mentioned as well the interconnectivity between the programmability that the central banks may provide as a foundation layer that should be extended and inherited by 
programmable pri programmable private sectors, and maybe that's even stable coins. So if you think about the, the value proposition of stable coins as a stable unit of digital currency with this kind of collateralization uh, construct that constantly gets reinvented by every new stable coin issuer, one value proposition that CBDC may have is to interlink kind of as a foundational M0 form of money and to build out stable coins on top of that in a way that's fully transparent and usable. So the question of programmable money may actually translate into how will stable coins link to a, a publicly available central bank digital currency and inherit attributes of that central currency and derive more and more features that are specific to the to the individual use case. Um, on 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 the topic of interoperability, I think that in general interoperability is a very loaded. Uh, terminology, so it really kind of necessitates more definition. The work that's being done by the OECD, I would think of as they're probably taking on the, the most challenging uh, notion of interoperability. In general, I like to split interoperability between horizontal interoperability and vertical interoperability. Horizontal interoperability at the lowest level being platform interoperability, which is the work that's being done by the OECD, and that's you know standardizations around different platform technologies. One level up for that, still on the horizontal line, would be within the context of the business. So very similar to you know correspondent banking interoperating between different central banks, you can have smart contracts at an application layer that are still horizontal, that can still cut across different blockchain platforms, that could still functionally provide that interoperability. The other notion of interoperability that would quickly introduce as well is this notion of vertical interoperability. So does my blockchain layer where where my where my digital assets are stored, be it you know securities or central bank digital currency, does it connect to my core banking infrastructure? Does it connect uh, upwards into my merchants and retail payment providers and things of that nature? So don't forget, there's a whole stack that's always involved involved where we're talking about digital assets and custody or or payments or anything like that. The last point that I would want to make is just quickly around central bank coordination and, and the notion of a hegemonic currency. And I think that what's really important here when we think about the digital tools that we have is that we're operating in a little bit of a, of a different environment. So until now, everything that we talk about when we talk about digital money is all account based. And when you think about how accounts connect to each other, they, they, they need to connect to each other. So if you're talking about a re reality where we have N players, you're talking about an exponential number of connect connections that need to happen between them. Because for me to connect to you, I need to link my account with your account and we get into the whole correspondent model. Tokenized assets offer a slightly different value proposition that fundamentally changes that narrative. And the notion is, as a bearer asset, I need only to interact with the asset itself and not the system from which it came from. So very similar to doing a payment versus payment for dollars against euros. If I hand you a hundred dollar bill and you hand me a hundred euros and it's one-to-one -one for whatever reason, I mean, the, the I need not interact with the system that issued these currencies. I only need to be able to custody the, the cash. And I think it's very, very analogous to that when we think about tokenized value and how central banks can coordinate and how we can offer, is there need for hegemonic currency or is this kind of tokenized bearer asset model the technology breakthrough that will enable us to focus first and foremost on our domestic environment, knowing that when the time comes to, to to interconnect, we don't need this exponential N squared problem. Rather, we can just say, this is my token. It's a bearer asset. And if you can custody it, you, you can claim, you can make a claim against its liability. So I think it fundamentally shifts our perspective on what is needed to coordinate this, this uh, type of global market infrastructure. Now, Simon, I don't know what you think, but I think uh, Daniel's just said something very important about exchanges of value between, I think he was saying between digital wallets, we can get rid of this whole complex account structure and all the exponential cat's cradle of, of connectivity that that requires and all the intermediation. What's your comment on what he's just said? Well, I think it's an excellent point. And I think it's, uh, it's right in line with how the, uh, the advancements in technology that we've seen over the past decade can be can be used to uh, to really open up uh, financial markets while still providing security and uh, and the ability to uh, to enforce regulation. Um, what what Daniel said is possible if central banks collaborate on policy and collaborate on technology design. It's really only possible if they tr if they truly do collaborate because uh, the the systems will need to be interoperable both from as Daniel mentioned both vertically. I think it's brilliant both vertically and horizontally, and so and and that means practically. Uh, if, if, you know, if we're designing a wallet in the Eastern Caribbean, 
and we want those wallets to also be able to uh, to to um, you know, be able to perform digital euro transactions, for example, then we need to ensure that that uh, that we're building to a standard that the ECB mm -hmm. will follow in the design and the deployment of their digital euro, and and that applies, I mean, across the board. So it's really, you know, and, and we've seen a number of efforts uh, on technical design standards and whatnot, and and those seem to be advancing. But I think the importance of those cannot be overstated. They're they're extremely important, and and. Uh, you know, so for central banks and the associated technology service providers like the R3s and the, and the bits of the world, um, that's really, you know, that's, that's where I'm focused for sure is to ensure that uh, we're providing and building payment solutions and CBDC solutions uh, that will be able to, to meet the needs of, uh, of sort of the globalized financial system as we uh, introduce CBDCs. Uh, one of the benefits often advance of a CBDC is that it's financial inclusion. So if you don't need a bank account, you don't need a bank, you just need a, a mobile telephone. Is that right? Yeah, That's again, cool. it comes it comes down to what the central banks prefer. But you would think, again, if they're going if they're going to harness the power of this technology, that they will enable payment service providers to integrate. And those payment service providers need only list their payment app in in the App Store or the Google Play Store, right? And so that really opens up access. Now, of course, they still have to follow AML compliance, right? So there needs to be identity verification and uh, you know KYC verification, transaction monitoring, et cetera, sanction screening. Uh, but but these are things that uh, that are largely provided as a service these days. They can be automated to some extent, and uh, and the cost for for that uh, they, it seems to also be coming down with technology. So um, yeah, I, I guess the answer is yes. You should only need to have an application, and again, that's that's one of the tangible ways that it could increase competition at the payments layer. You you really what what the central bank is doing is they're harnessing or they're they're burdening the cost of running this network so that payment service providers can come in and just provide the the customer support, unique uh, value-added services in, in the context of payments, uh, and and basically to, to handle yeah to, to handle their customers and to provide that value. So instead of uh, whereas in the past they would have to maintain the ledger, they would have to process and settle transactions, they would have to have correspondent banking. Um, now, if they can integrate into one or more CBDC networks, they you know they all of a sudden are able to run a payments business with much less operational and technological burden. Well, this raises a, a, a substantial issue. You might be able to get financial inclusion, but can you have financial integrity uh, in this system? You, you, Simon, have mentioned, you know, AML, KYC, sanction screening checks, and, uh, and so on. So, all of the all of those those checks at the moment uh, run on on a bank account system. Right? Who is who is the beneficial owner of this of this bank account, um, and it raises a, a third uncomfortable question about privacy. Rob raised this as, as something which central banks are, are, now, are now talking about. So let's talk a little bit about the balance that has to be struck between, uh, between financial inclusion, financial integrity, and, and privacy. Um, Daniel, do you, do you have a, a view on that? I'm sure Rob does. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the ECB came out recently and said, you know, that there will be no privacy with, uh, there will be no anonymity with central bank digital currencies. And, and in, in general, I would, I, I would agree. I think it also kind of begs the question of, is it the role of the central bank to provide privacy and anonymity to, to the users of a currency? And, and, and if you, if you think about the, 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 you know, the precedent comes from cash, which is actually a technological limitation of the instrument, rather uh, something that was done by, by choice or by, by uh, design. Um, I think with 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 privacy, you know, it's a spectrum and it's a scale. And I think for every domestic economy, it's going to be about uh, hitting hitting the the, the right um, you know threading the needle and, and getting the right balance between enabling enough privacy um, to to incentivize users to 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 use the the medium uh, versus um, you know putting the right guardrails in place to, to limit any illicit, um, illicit use of, of the instrument. So, um, you know, I think that the challenge is from, at least from a technological standpoint is to, to create, um, you know, a payment structure and a, and a structure for the asset itself that has the right, you know, dials, so to speak, so that it can be tweaked to the exact level of privacy that's needed in, uh, in, in the economy. Um, and I, I don't think that's going to be an, a, an easy task at all. Uh, I think, and, and I guess the last thing that I would say is when we talk about privacy, it's, it's nice to kind of lump it into a general term, but I would, I, would, um, I would put forward the notion of whenever we're thinking about privacy to talk, talk about privacy of what and from whom. 
Uh, and when you think about it like that, you all of a sudden get this matrix of, of things that we would like to keep private and with respect to who, and you can start reasoning about it in a way that's a little bit more granular than this just kind of ominous notion of privacy at large. Now, Rob, before you talk about this, because I'd be interested in your views, let me read you something which I read written yesterday, or I read it yesterday, uh, from the, the CEO of a Bitcoin wallet provider. He said, for global regulators and central banks, Bitcoin and crypto is no longer an abstract curiosity. They represent a threat to the financial orthodoxy. That is why different central banks are prepping their CBDCs. And when they're finally deployed, governments will have far more control of your money. With their new CBDCs, they'll be able to censor your transactions for any reason. We've talked about programmability, for example, and they'll be able to confiscate your money much more easily compared to what they can do with the existing banking system. This is only going to drive more people to Bitcoin. Now, that's a, a classic, um, you know, blockchain libertarian perspective, but it must form part of the thinking of central banks and global market regulators. Rob, how do you strike the right balance in a credible way between financial inclusion, financial integrity and personal privacy? Sure. Thanks. I would say that, that that quote makes me seem more reasonable in what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. So I would say that fi you mentioned first financial integrity. And I think that financial integrity is a shared goal, depending on how you define that. But it's a shared goal across jurisdictions and across central banks. You want financial integrity, market integrity, trust in the currency. Now, when you talk about privacy, I really think that's country and culture specific. And whatever decisions the central bank makes will have an impact on the competitive dynamics between a central bank digital currency and forms of stablecoin and, and, and other forms of collateralized or uncollateralized crypto assets. And that choice, uh, privacy might be a component in that choice. So if you have a central bank, either it, either it, it, it explicitly, explicitly does not provide the anonymity or there's a perception that it doesn't, you may find that other forms of crypto assets are more appealing to certain players because they want it. Others probably have more to say about that. I will, I will leave it there. Mm -hmm. Sebastian, do you have more to say about that? Thanks, Olivia. For, uh, on a professional level, none. But on the personal level, I can appreciate the debate and I can see where, where the, the challenges are. Uh, I, I, I actually believe that there is a way to replicate cash on a ledger and, and uh, limitations of the paper and coins uh, if you really want to, but I don't think this is where we're gonna go. So, uh, so I, I'm gonna be interested in the developments, but I'm more of a, of a user than a, a professional on this one. Well, we're, we're running over time uh, now, but the audience seems to be staying with us. So we'll stay with it uh, for a few more minutes. Um, an interesting uh, point has been raised here by Ken Ayagongo, uh, he says, I might be late, but I was wondering something. Are the CBDC going to use available blockchains or are they mostly going to build their own on a country by country basis? Uh, well, actually, thank you, Ken. That doesn't, uh, you're not too late. It's quite a, uh, it, it's one of the things we wanted to talk about was, was the technology issues. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, most CBDC pilots are running on, on blockchain technology um, uh, rather than central database technology. Um, uh, Sven, perhaps you have a, a, a view on this, but but Keith, I'd also like you to give us a sense, and I'm sure Simon has some views on it as well. Where are we, you know, when these CBDCs are launched, uh, are they all going to be on blockchain? Are they going to build their own? Uh, or are some of them going to be on central old-fashioned database technology? I mean, <clears throat> in my head, um, I would associate the idea of a CBDC with blockchain, but absolutely there's no need for it. And China is a perfect example that actually at the core is, we all know we're excited about the CBDC, but at the core is a um, traditional database and that has to do with uh, scalability in, in that instance. I think the issue here is really more from the perspective is now every central bank building their own, you know, uh, uh, software and their own protocol and so we're ending up with what is a 200 different uh, uh, CBDCs and then we have the next 20 years of work ahead how we create an interoperability between these different standards or um, and uh, I think Daniel will have a lot to say <clears throat> that I think there's a uh, high likeliness like we see it for any of the other markets that there are a number of um, uh, protocols that uh, have become sort of uh, widely adopted and people will make their choice however um, and this is a, a key issue here for me is if we are dealing really with um, 
um, in CBDC probably will fall into that aspect, a uh, permission network. In a way, as soon as you start to create and define your own business logic, whether they all, you know, in our today's world, if your PC runs on, you know, Microsoft or not, uh, or Windows, it, still you can configure this in a way that makes it very unique and uh, um, uh, difficult to interact with. So I think uh, the, the core fundamental, uh, I would say, uh, I w I'm not afraid uh, that we will seem too much proliferation. I think people will gravitate towards the the uh, protocols that have already um, uh, become more attractive. But uh, whether you're then really able to plug and play, I doubt it very much so, um, because uh, each and every central bank, uh, and I think Rob mentioned this, will have their own preference, how they configure things, who they let in, who they don't. So you will have to, at least for the moment, uh, do a per CPDC, take a per CPDC view and uh, look how they have uh, solved for that. Keith, uh, Simon, uh, I'd love to hear from you about this, but Keith, first, uh, central banks are not called central for nothing. They're bound to be slightly uncomfortable with distributed technology. Uh, yet <sighs> the view has been, I think, up to this point that the blockchain isn't sufficiently mature. It's not sufficiently fast enough, which may be why the, the Chinese initiative is taking place on some other technology. I think it's working on 300,000 transactions a second, and we've got blockchain doing 20 a second or, or whatever it is. Um, and Visa does, I think, 65,000 a second. So you, you need speed uh, as well as reliability. Um, can we have, a, is it possible, Keith, to have a hybrid of, of blockchain and central database technology, which works? Uh, yeah, definitely it is, I think. Um, just on your points, first of all, I think the BIS surveys show that DLT is the most common approach to CBDC. Yes. Uh, and if you're going to build a CBDC on uh, a digital ledger technology, uh, then I think you probably need a good reason if you're not going to use one of the commercial uh, options that are available, like Corda from Daniel, etc., uh, which already have a lot of engineering experience built into them to tackle all the kind of problems that are required in terms of security, privacy, performance, etc. Uh, and it's only going to be the large um, entities, like you said, the People's Bank of China, for instance, which are likely to want to take on that engineering effort themselves. So I think for other, others than, other than the very top of the house, I think it's much more likely that we'll see the commercial enterprise blockchain platforms succeeding. And I think that's you know shown by the pilots that are already taking place um, with that, that kind of approach. Um, uh, in terms of your um, uh, point on scalability as well, I mean, uh, the enterprise blockchain technology platforms can these days get up to five or 6,000 uh, transactions per second, for example. Uh, so this may not be big enough to China to your point, but it may well be big enough, uh, comfortable enough for smaller jurisdictions. Uh, so I still think uh, scalability isn't necessarily a reason other than for the much larger economies for, for that to be a, a major issue. Mm -hmm. So Simon, is, it, is this the way forward? Build it on an enterprise blockchain, stick it in the cloud, off you go. Uh, uh, it, yeah, I, yeah I, th I think that or, I mean, I, I think that's how we'll start anyway. And I, and I actually wrote about this in a blog post for the OECD as well. Um, I, I guess it's a, it's a good opportunity to keep in mind that uh, I mean, like Bitcoin or not, that's that's where the the initial use uh, use case of the technology came about, right? In two thousand nine, it was released, and uh, and then here we are, you know, here we are today with you know multiple iterations of uh, of distributed networks for value transfer, and so uh, I think that uh, and and certainly Daniel and R, Daniel and R three have done an incredible job, sort of. Uh, uh, leveraging elements of uh, of blockchain technology and distributed ledger technology to provide enterprise grade uh, 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 blockchain networks. That's uh, absolutely the case, and so I think we'll see that. Um, when I read the question, I was I was wondering if if Ken was uh, was asking, you know, if any public blockchains would be used, and and I don't think uh, I think maybe the answer is obvious there for this crowd that um, it, that it's not there yet. Although if they scale over the coming years, we may actually see more institutions uh, build on them. So I think for the time being, it's about uh, the enterprise service providers um, taking what they can and iterating on their own solutions for of enterprise uh, blockchain. Uh, the one point I did want to make is that distributed governance is becomes particularly interesting and achievable when you when you leverage uh, some of these newer technologies. So uh, if so when we think about how a CBDC network could function, and I think actually the Project Aber report uh, was really, really interesting for this, where uh, it, 
they, you basically have a system where the central bank runs a number of nodes. You have your financial institutions run nodes. And, and obviously there's opportunity for other bodies, regulatory bodies uh, as well to, to run nodes of this network. And obviously the designs increase in complexity, but they also increase in terms of uh, being more robust and, and way less points of failure and the ability to maintain operation and continuity if under attack or in a, in a disaster scenario like a power outage and, and these sorts of things. So certainly the, the distributed governance element is really, really interesting to me. And I think that that's going to play a role. And, and, and it's one of the areas where distributed ledger technology and blockchains can be harnessed uh, by, these, uh, by these institutions. Uh, I'd like Daniel to comment on this as well. Just before you, you go, Simon, you're working with a, with a central bank. Uh, what's your experience of being and how well equipped the central bank is actually to, to make choices of this kind in terms of selecting the technologies, building it, managing it, operating it? Because in the end, you know, a CBDC is a, is a, is a technological project, but it's a, it's a lot more than that. Uh, it's a pretty crucial yeah. one, but it's still a project management exercise, isn't it? And Absolutely. How, yeah. I, how realistic are they about their capabilities? Um, just, I, I would say, just like any institution that embarks on a new technology product, there's going to be a learning curve, and uh, and and there's, you know, there's a lot more. It's a lot more than just a technology product. These institutions are wrapping their heads around the organizational change that will take place uh, and all the different elements that they will have to manage and what stakeholders are, are truly required to execute on a, on a retail level CBDC project. So it's, it's no small feat. And I think the ECCB has done a great job uh, in, in terms of stepping up and, and truly understanding the requirements. Um, that being said, central banks are, you know, by definition, are, they are they're centralized institutions that are meant to move, sl move slowly in order to ensure all risks are identified. Uh, because when you are the monetary authority of a nation, you can't very well move quickly and break things like Silicon Valley likes to do, right? You, you, you have to take into consideration the risks, uh, just be given what's at stake. And so I think, thankfully, what, you know, the software component can be sandbox tested and, and researched and, and simulated. And so I th that's where I think the central banks are, are sort of, you know, uh, at least the ECCB is, is past that stage, but a lot of the international central banks are uh, are, are beginning there and recognizing, yes, we can design and deploy these solutions and, and test them and uh, vigorously, you know, and rigorously in the, uh, in, in their own environments before getting released to the public. So it is a huge undertaking. Uh, and, and, but I think central banks are wrapping their head around that now. And that's evident by the research that's coming out. I mean, we've seen the research come out, Bank of Canada, Bank of England, of course, has been doing so for years. Uh, Banque de France as well had a, a great paper last year. And, and, uh, and so we're, yeah, I think we're seeing uh, more and more central banks level up their knowledge from a technology perspective and, and truly wrap their heads around uh, the multifaceted, um, you know, elements of, uh, of these projects. Daniel, I know, I know you have to go. So why don't you just, because we need to wrap up now, we're, we're 15 minutes over, over our time anyway. Um, and I'd like to ask all the panelists just to give us a, a, a few parting comments. But Daniel, everything we, that I've heard this afternoon indicates that you know CBDCs are gonna happen. They seem almost unstoppable. Uh, what can we look forward to in terms of what they're able to do that we can't do with digital payments, services and digi digi almost digitized currencies today. What can we look forward to? Leave us on a yeah. hopeful note, as it were. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Thanks, Dominic. Um, you know, I, I, I heard the terms here, you know, that that some of the payment infrastructure that we have now is is sufficient for 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 specific uses, whether it's, you know, domestic RTGSs and, and things like that. I think I, I think the answer the answer to, to your question, Dominic, is that we need to think about the future of our economy, uh, you know, in, in, in a much longer, with a much longer time horizon. Uh, so what's our economy going to be in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, in 25 years, which is the average lifespan of some of the, some of the uh, financial infrastructure projects that we're working on. Uh, and, and in that sense, you know, we, we heard about micropayments, we heard a little bit of IoT devices, uh, um, you know, things like that. The economy as we know it will not just be agents that are, that are people, it will be agents that are IoT devices, sometimes uh, algorithms uh, within digital environments that don't necess necessitate a device. And, and the borders that we have on traditional payment uh, structures um, don't really exist in the digital space. So when we think about the ability to move, tra to transfer value independently of space and time, I think that that is the value proposition 
uh, that that uh, CBDCs and, and tokenized assets uh, enable us. Uh, and we see this on the digital asset side, and we're seeing this as a, as a as a payment structure as well. So I think that um, I think that the, the the trajectory is is incredibly optimistic um, because we're not adding another layer to an existing infrastructure. We are really rethinking the the base and the core. Um, so you know, I feel excited uh, very much in a way that you know we're looking at the first version of the iPhone sitting here, you know, postulating on what can we do with this new incredible device? Not even, you know, those, those un, unknowns, unknowns are, are a huge area of our, of our space. And, you know, nobody could imagine what, uh, in, what the impact of smartphones have done on, on our society uh, when Steve Jobs first came up on stage and waved that little, that little device. And here, less than 10 years later, you know, look at where we are. And I think that we're going to be in a very, very similar situation with, uh, with, uh, with digital currencies, be it central bank digital currencies or stable coins uh, or digital assets at large. So I think that the trajectory is uh, incredibly, incredibly optimistic. And, and I feel very fortunate to, uh, to, be, to be involved with such, a, such an incredible industry. Thank you, Daniel. If you need to go, do, do feel free to do so. Thanks very much for, for everything you, you contributed, particularly your, your, your very uh, powerful observations in the middle of this, of this discussion, which uh, I'm going to make sure we draw everyone's attention to in the, in the follow-up. Uh, so do go if you, if you feel you need to. Um, thank thank you as well, Dominic. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Uh, Keith, do you, um, you heard Daniel mention there uh, about the innovations which we don't know which we're going to, we're going to get from this. Um, can you think of any which we can look forward to? I, I often point to uh, security tokens, for example, which are kind of waiting for CBDCs to solve the, the cash leg uh, of securities transactions, but perhaps you can think of others? Uh, I think the one you mentioned is really good, and uh, I think all eyes, including mine, mine and Sven, will be uh, on uh, Zurich and what's going to happen with SDX uh, this year, which is you know purported to uh, be moving forward not only with the work they've been doing with BIS and the Swiss National Bank but uh, uh, the SDX's own objectives so I think that'll be fascinating. Uh, just on CBDC I mean it is uh, one of the things that particularly interesting I think from my point of view is uh, particularly in China how this may rebalance between uh, the, the large fintechs the ants and the WeChat Pays etc versus the commercial banks because obviously there's been a big movement from uh, yeah, and it's true in the West as well, from uh, businesses, from com the traditional commercial banks to the innovative startups, the large scale fintechs, etc. Uh, CBDC is being implemented through a commercial bank, gives the commercial banks a chance to redress some of the balance, being able to uh, create their own forms of innovation uh, in that respect. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity facing commercial banks. Uh, I'll be fascinated to see how this actually translates into you know, real innovation. Um, whether it shifts the balance between the incumbents and the fintechs as far as the financial services ecosystem is concerned. Uh, thank you, Keith. Sven, do you, do you have any private sector apps you're particularly looking forward to? We've mentioned tokenization, security mm -hmm. tokens. Anything else on your list? Uh, so I am a big fan of this idea of what the Bank of England calls a synthetic CBDC. So basically a private public partnership. So you have blockchain enable digital payment solution providers and they hook up with the RTGS system and uh, therefore you get all of the benefits, most of them uh, from, from a uh, blockchain driven payment solution, but you maintain somewhat the current structure of a tiered system, etc. And uh, at least um, in terms of the sequence of how markets could adopt uh, these kind of uh, these forms of payments, I think it's, 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 it's the right way forward. Um, and so the, the thing really being that uh, we, we have a way of maintaining the current uh, split that you have in almost every Western market. You have a high value payment system and you have retail payment system. So you maintain this and you allow each of these actors to focus on, on what they're most interested in. So what we're working on is um, uh, it's in the public domain, Finality International, which is trying to do exactly that, a blockchain driven payment solution and it's connecting to central bank systems. So it's to do with uh, enabling the cash flag of security tokens, but also think about, uh, particularly when it comes to programmability of money, uh, 
improving aspects such as FX payments or um, in terms of the, if you had a 24 seven uh, instant payment mechanism, you no longer have even the concept of a Hearst at risk because everything can settle, uh, you know, your two legs of an FX transaction only if and when both sides are in place and uh, settle atomically. So I think these are some real changes, real business benefits we could see for the institutional market. But we hopefully can do this uh, not having to wait for the CBDC, but actually doing this uh, via so-called uh, synthetic CBDC structure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sven. A, a few uplifting thoughts from you. Sebastian, what's on your list of exciting innovations we can look forward to as a result of a CBDC? Well, um, I think there are already quite a few exciting things using the distributed ledger that are happening uh, more on the wholesale side, unfortunately. Uh, for for the end user that uh, a consumer like me could be, but uh, I, you you can clearly see that on defined use cases for subsets of the way the world works, you have some interesting applications, uh, and uh, and that shows that there is a future. Having said that, it is very difficult to uh, think like a, a technologist on an established way of the world and take a blank page and redesign the whole thing. And this is, I, it feels to me that this is what a retail CDB, CBDC does. And which is why uh, I find that the, the timeline may be the most challenging thing ahead of us because clearly the brains are there. The technology is increasingly proving its value, but the challenges remain to, to shift and, and, and lift, I'm sorry, lift and shift what you're doing into this, this new world of possibilities. And there, I, I am, I am, I am, you know, I'm, I'm basically counting my my coins and saying, fine, we have a working solution that costs so much and works like this. You know, how much does it cost for me to move to where I am into this new world, and and how much benefit will I get? And this is where, you know, uh, there is a lot of groundwork that needs to be done before you you get there. I think, and uh, it's all exciting. I, I totally understand the 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 rosy picture of a future for 20 years down the road with IoT, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, I, I'd say that for now, there is a lot of work ahead of us to make that excitement a reality. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Simon, your list of exciting innovations, nobody has mentioned direct payments yet, you know, like the furlough payments we've had during this uh, pandemic or disaster relief or just economic stimulus payments. Mm -hmm. What are you looking forward to? Um, well, I think, look, I, I think Sebastian made a really interesting point there about, uh, you know, a, rose, a potential rosy future. And I, I think while I recognize that, and I think there's a lot of sense in, in that statement, um, the exponential sort of development and disruption that technology just generally uh, poses for every industry seems to be unstoppable. And so it, it's, it's kind of like a wave that's coming and you, know, you either have to hop on and, and ride it or, uh, or you, you, will, you, know, you, you may very well find yourself <laughs> underneath it uh, in some form or fashion. I mean, so I would just say, you know, absolutely. There are so many different use cases for CBDCs and digital payments generally um, that you know, I could take a lot of time uh, running us through those. But uh, I, I think if I were to speak more broadly, I would just say it's, it's, it's kind of uh, an imperative to keep up with how technology is moving and, uh, and to stay on the ball in order to be able to, to harness and, and, and keep up with the, the pace of, uh, of technological change and technological evolution. So that's, uh, I think those would be my parting words. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Simon. Perhaps we'll come back to a list of use cases in uh, CBDCs three. Rob, can I give you sure. the opportunity to, to, to sort of wave us out uh, with some with some final comments on this? Uh, as you've heard, there's lots of, of different ways in which CBDCs could affect change and improvement and enhancement. But that's also packed with with risk. What's the regulatory perspective on all this excitement? Sure, I was I was going to build on Simon's positive note and talk about the untapped potential of tokenization of assets. <laughs> that I makes cost you in a, in a in a depressing <laughs> role. Uh, That's right, but I would say yeah. and, and but so so I do think there are been untapped benefits and the disruption in capital markets and creation of efficiencies on the on, on in, in tokenization. CBDCs can 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 only help bring that forward. But you're right, there are a number of risks. Um, I, I think from our standpoint, I think the interplay instead of asking the question if. Let's assume that in some form, you're gonna have central bank digital currency, stable coins, 
other type of crypto assets, and they will be engaging uh, in domestically and cross-border if you assume that, then I think the, the, um, the interplay between supervision and market regulation, particularly when you take the growth of DeFi into account, is really important. And frankly, despite some very good work in this area, I think a lot more thinking will be needed once choices are made by the good work that's being done in pilots, for instance, with retail CBDC. When you see a few countries start to make choices and roll it out, and you see intended and un unintended consequences, I think supervisors or regulators are going to give a lot more thought to what they need to do with their current, um, their current um, level of, of regulations and enforcement in order to make things safe and trustworthy. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we must stop now, but, but I want to keep up our track record of at least recording what uh, all our audience have said. Peter Davies says, interesting to note the Chinese solution on a bespoke card to remove dependency on the phone and Wi-Fi, so sort of tokenized prepaid cards. Mondex lives again uh, in the Chinese CBDC experiment. Um, thank you, Peter, for that observation worth noting. Um, Laurent Bruchet says, a very naive question, are there any examples of central banks providing the payment infrastructure in any major country? Isn't that type of infrastructure typically provided by private actors, admittedly regulated, but private nonetheless? I think I can answer that, Laurent. Uh, in every country, the central bank runs the real-time gross settlement system, which settles net payments between banks uh, in central bank money, between their settlement accounts at the central bank, but there are lots of automated clearing houses, which are indeed run by private sector actors of various kinds. I hope that's, I hope you'd agree with me, I've said the right thing, Rob, um, you would know. So I think with that, uh, we, we, must, uh, we must stop. Uh, so I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Daniel Eden of R3 and Keith Baer from the Judge School at Cambridge, both of them have had to leave already. Uh, Simon Chantry from BIT, uh, Sebastian and Gregory and Sven Werner from State Street. And of course, Rob uh, Pratano from the OECD. Thank you to all of our panelists uh, and thank you also to our audience. Our next webinar is next week, Tuesday, 19th of January, same time, same place, I'm sorry to say. Uh, and we'll be looking at one of our favorite themes, uh, data, in particular, the data problem and data opportunity and asset management. I hope lots of you will join us then, but for now, it's goodbye from the seven of us. Thank you for joining us. You can find this discussion on www.futureoffinance.biz and indeed other uh, planned webinars under current events. I am Wendy Gallagher. If you would like uh, more information about how to work with us, please do email on wendy.gallagher at futureoffinance.biz. Thank you once again.